Well, hey, we just wanted to say thank you for tuning in and watching these teachings. Wherever you're coming from, however you listen, we consider it a real privilege to bring the Word of God to you. And it's been a while for our church since we've been in one of the Gospels, and so this season, we're going to be studying through Mark together because we just feel led to look at the Gospels, learn from Jesus, and be his disciples. So let's go to the teaching together. I love Easter. Who, who loves Easter? How many of you love Easter? Yeah. You don't, you don't have to say that. I know we're in church, but... I love Easter because there's faith in the room, there's praise in the room, there's joy in the room, the room's packed, and I don't know, but but maybe it would surprise you to find out that the first Easter, there wasn't faith, there wasn't joy, and there wasn't praise. There was terror, (laughs) confusion, and fear. Would you go to the original story with me? We're going to look at Mark 16, uh, Mark's account of the first Easter morning, the resurrection of Jesus. And as we read through the story again, it, it might surprise you, not, not the caricature of Easter, but, but the real events, the real story. We're going through Mark's gospel on Sunday mornings, and so I wanted to look together at Mark's account But here's what Mark records on the first Easter. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, They saw that the stone had been rolled back, for it was very large. The first thing that you have to just observe with me is that the women that went to the tomb the first Easter morning are amazing. Their love and devotion for Jesus, their their courage to come and anoint his body for burial, you just have to be so full of admiration for these women on that that first Easter morning. But then we keep reading, verse five, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. See the place where they laid him. And go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. For there you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So these courageous, incredible, devoted Women go to the tomb, and when they see the stone rolled away, when they hear the message that Jesus is risen, they didn't say, he's risen indeed, with a smile on their face. It says, notice these three words, flee or fled, trembling and astonished. That word fled is is what you do in the face of a crisis. It's the same word that describes the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane just a few nights before when Jesus' enemies came to arrest him. They, they fled. That word trembling, it, it speaks of involuntary shaking. It's a physiological response to something terrifying. And the word astonished means a profound emotional experience to the point of being beside oneself. Now, before we're tempted to be at all critical of these women, we have to ask ourselves, and where were the guys? Where were the disciples? 
Where were Peter and John and James and the guys that Jesus chose and said, you're going to be my closest followers? You want to know where they were? Hiding. It's true. And if you keep reading, let's keep reading. Uh, Verse 9, now when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him. So she found the guys that were hiding, tells them the news, and they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they said, he is risen indeed. (laughs) No. (laughs) They would not believe it. So here's an honest, unflattering picture of the first followers of Jesus. And what I want to do this morning, hopefully, in just the short time that we have, is I want to speak to our heads, and I want to speak to our hearts, hopefully in a way that will change some of our lives. Because this is an amazing story. And so the first thing I have is a challenge for our minds Notice, there's a couple of things I want you to notice in this story. Notice all of the names that are named. And the ones that we read about here in Mark 16, they're repeated. In fact, if you back up into chapter 15, these three names, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary uh, Magdalene, and Salome, they keep showing up. We keep being told that these were the three women at the cross When Jesus died, these were the three women that helped his body be taken down and buried in the tomb. These are the three women that show up on the first Easter. Why do we keep hearing their names? Mark is going to great lengths to tell us these women saw the most important events that are at the heart of our faith. These were the eyewitnesses. In other words, this is Mark's cited Sources. What he's claiming is incredible. Jesus is risen from the dead. And so if you're going to claim something like that, you have to provide uh, real proof, right? How can you say something like that, Mark? Well, he says, go talk to these three women. These are like the footnotes in Mark's gospel because he was writing within 25 years of the events. And so he keeps repeating their names. Why? So that the people that hear the story, the people that read these words could have a source, these women, by name to go to and say, let's hear your story. You could cross-examine them. You could ask them questions because they were there and they saw it for themselves. I'm convinced that this is what's behind the success and the spread of Christianity from the very start was the electrifying eyewitness testimony of women like Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and Salome. So that's important. There's eyewitnesses that were alive. You know, this church is just a little bit over 25 years old. And there were people that were here when this church started that could tell you the stories from that time. Just like these women could tell you the story for themselves of what they saw. But I want you to also notice in Mark's account, no one has a positive response to the news. We're here today celebrating, giving God praise, full of faith, but no one on that day had a positive response. And and what What adds to the weight of that reality, that observation, is Jesus had been warning them. He'd been telling them exactly what was going to happen. Jesus had been telling them along the way, hey, by the way, when we get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be crucified. But in three days, I'll rise again. He told them beforehand. Look at Mark 8, 31. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Jesus told them straight up what was going to happen. Mark 10, 33, Jesus says, See, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. 
And they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they'll mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. He, he couldn't say it any clearer. But what do you notice in Mark's account of the first Easter morning? Not one person is expecting this to actually happen. Jesus told them, none of them believed it. Not one disciple is saying, hey, isn't it the third day today? Didn't Jesus say after three, you know, I mean, that's hard to believe, but we should at least go check, right? It can't hurt after all if we just go see, but none of them are doing that. It's not even worth going to see for themselves. And the question is, why, why does Mark record it this way? And here's, here's why I want you to consider this this morning. Mark is showing us that the resurrection was inconceivable. Does that word make anybody think of Princess Bride? The little, <laughs> the little bald guy, inconceivable. <laughs> it was. It was impossible for them to believe this. It was as impossible for them to believe this as it is for people like us. And so here's, here's what's beautiful about that. If you have doubts today about whether or not this could really be true, welcome to the club. You would fit right in Mark's story in Mark 16. But just don't be guilty today. If you have doubts, that, that's okay. Just don't be guilty of what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. What's that? I was listening to a, a podcast debate this week on whether or not the resurrection really happened. There was someone who believed and someone who was a skeptic, and both sides agreed that the only way you can approach a question like that is to use what's called the inference to the best explanation. That's the only tool as a historian that you could use to get to the bottom, if you would, of an unobserved cause. None of us were there. None of us could see with our own eyes. None of us could go ask these women for ourselves today. And so how do we get to the bottom of a claim like this? And, and what they say is you start with the bedrock facts. And, and all scholars, virtually all scholars believe that the three facts of this story that are undeniable are these three things. Number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. Everyone agrees. Number two, shortly after his death, a number of his followers had experiences that they at least interpreted as Jesus risen from the dead. And number three, Paul, a very zealous Jewish Pharisee, was persecuting Christians, and he had an experience that he interpreted as encountering the risen Jesus, which so transformed his life that though he was once a persecutor of the church, he became the church's greatest promoter. And so once you have those kind of bedrock facts, what you have to do is you have to form a hypothesis to explain them. How did that happen? How did those things come about? And when you begin, I believe, when you begin to look at the different theories, the resurrection itself by far rises to the top. And the skeptic in the, in the podcast that I was listening to this week, the skeptic doesn't dispute the facts. He says, I'll grant you the facts. The skeptic doesn't refute the method. He says, that's right. You have to use the logical you know, inference to the best explanation. And so what's the alternative hypothesis? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what actually happened? And here's what people say. It's, it's, it makes a lot of sense. Well, Jesus was a really charismatic leader and teacher, and his followers were obviously very committed, and so somehow along the way, he convinced them that he was divine. And he wouldn't be the first one, right? Even in our lifetime, we've seen people come on the scene that have convinced their followers that they're somehow divine in some way. And so after Jesus' death, his followers decided that the best way to preserve his legacy was to put forward a myth 
that he came back from the dead because people back then were superstitious and believed stuff like that. It still leaves the question, what about Paul? All the skeptics said, here's what happened. They bribed Paul with money and he joined the movement and that's how Christianity spread. That's the alternative theory. It makes sense. It's a, it's a reasonable explanation, I guess. But I want to submit to you, that's what's called chronological snobbery. <laughs> what part? The part that says, oh, people back then, they were superstitious. They believed stuff like that. We're too sophisticated to believe stuff like that. We're too educated to believe stuff like that. Can we just stop right there? Anybody, you don't have to raise your hand, maybe they're with you this morning, but anybody know any conspiracy theorists? Anybody know any people that are, don't raise your hand. <laughs> anybody know anyone that's superstitious? That's not true to say, oh, people back then were superstitious and we're not. But you know what else isn't true? When you read Mark's account, what kind of people do you find in the story? Do you find people who are superstitious schemers that are ready to believe a story like this? Or, like we read, do you find people who are totally unprepared to believe that this could be true? And remember, the record that we have that we're reading, the record was preserved by the people who eventually did come to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And so here's my question. Why didn't they clean it up a little bit? They're writing 25 years later. I think if I was writing this, I would say, I knew it all along. <laughs> the other guys, they were afraid. The women fled in terror, but I knew. I knew it was gonna happen, and so I wanted to write it down. They don't clean up the story. They don't make themselves heroic, inspiring leaders of the Christian movement. They preserve the story as it happens, showing themselves to be terrified and completely without any category to understand the events of the first Easter. Apparently, it was as impossible for them to believe as it is for people like us. So here's the question. How did they come to believe? And here's the answer. They allowed the evidence to challenge their worldview. They didn't want to believe it. They were terrified. They couldn't bring themselves to believe it at first, even though Jesus told them. But you know what? Eventually, they couldn't deny it because the tomb was empty and they touched and heard and saw Jesus alive from the dead. They allowed the evidence to challenge their worldview. And I want to ask you this morning to do the same. Will you consider the evidence that the tomb is empty and that Jesus is alive? It's a real challenge for our minds. If you don't believe, you'd fit right in with the first people on that Easter morning. But you have to ask, what's a better explanation? Do we really believe that these kinds of people and with a bribe to Paul were willing to suffer and be tortured for a message that they knew wasn't true? Uh, in many ways, that takes more faith, I think, than the message that we're celebrating this morning. Well, now I want to speak to your heart for a minute because there's something in this story that I think is so, so beautiful. And it's in verse 7, if you'd look at that with me again, in Mark's account of the first Easter in Mark 16. It says, go, this is the, the, the angel, the messenger in the tomb, when the women come to see for themselves. He says, go tell his disciples and Peter. Now you have to know the story, but this, this is beautiful. <laughs> And Peter. 
You imagine the women run back to where the disciples are hiding and they say, he's alive. I mean, we don't know. It's terrifying, but that's what we were told. And so we're delivering the message. And by the way, Peter, he wants to see you. He said you by name. If you know the story, Peter, Peter was the ringleader. He was the one that when they came to arrest him, Peter said, Jesus, these guys might leave you, but I won't. I'll die before I ever leave you. Peter was the one that said, I will never deny you, Jesus. And yet three times, Peter denied him that very night. And so the message, listen to this message on the first Easter. Go tell my disciples and make sure you tell Peter. Peter, Jesus wants to see you. Now we can imagine what that, what that would have looked like. You know, Jesus showing up in Galilee. Peter, come here. Come here. But if you know the story, it's in John's gospel. We won't turn there, but it's, it's so beautiful. Jesus restores Peter and says, Peter, I want you to lead things from here. You're going to be really, really important in spreading the good news of my kingdom. And I love this because here's the message of grace on Easter, that the biggest failure becomes the greatest leader in the kingdom of God. How could that be? Well, here's, here's, here's the theology. Peter's repentance would be the deepest because his failure was the biggest. Peter's love and devotion would be the strongest because he had experienced forgiveness. Peter's grasp of grace would be the greatest. And so Jesus says, you're the guy. Would you agree with me that self-righteous people don't represent Jesus well? Self-righteous people don't represent Jesus well. That's why he chose Peter. Because Peter would have such a grasp of God's grace. Peter would know that the gospel of salvation is not for the strong and for the capable. It's for the undeserving and the weak. And so the gospel opens both of our eyes on this Easter morning. What do I mean by that? Well, like Peter, we see our failure, we see our weakness, we see our sin. But like Peter, we can see also how unfailing and faithful the love of God is. Go tell my people, and especially Peter, I don't know if any of you today feel like you've failed in some way that you can never come back from or you feel like you've fallen short or messed things up. What I love about the message of Easter is that it's all about a new beginning. <laughs> it's all about the grace of God. Go tell my disciples and tell Peter. And I think this is what gives people like us a whole new way of looking at life. How about, how about if we call it today the view from the empty tomb? The view from the empty tomb. Would you take just a minute in your imagination to go with me in Mark's account? Imagine that you're one of those women or you're with them at least. And you stoop down to step into the tomb that's been carved out of a rock. The stone is moved to the side, and there on your right is a, a shelf, a bench that's been carved out about waist high where the body would have been laid. And you see that it's empty. 
And you, you hear the message of the messenger dressed in white there saying, don't be afraid. He's risen. Did you notice that in Mark's account? The, the messenger says, he told you. Why are you surprised? I love it because the angels were surprised by his death. The Bible says that the angels look into that with wonder, that, that God would allow himself to die on a cross. But you know what angels aren't surprised by? His power. Now, that's not surprising. Why are you surprised? That he would rise from the dead, that he would conquer death. And so imagine you're there and you, you don't know what to do with what you're taking in, and so you turn and you look out of the opening of the tomb and you look back out and you hear the sounds and see the sights of Jerusalem. It's familiar. The pain, the brokenness, the turmoil, the suffering, the soldiers. It's all the same out there. But imagine now that because the tomb is empty, you have a whole different view of everything that you're seeing and hearing. And here's what, I wanna, here's what I wanna ask you to consider. Everyone chooses a perspective at this point. Do we believe it? And what if it's true or not? If we don't, we just go back out into that world of turmoil and brokenness and confusion and and we carry on. But if it's true, it changes everything. See, for people like us, it's, it's hard to face the problems of this world if we think that this broken world is all we'll ever have. But the reality of the resurrection is this. God is going to raise us up and he's going to renew this world. Everything lost will be redeemed by the risen Savior, Jesus. I don't know if you've ever heard the story of a woman named Johnny Erickson Tata. She was paralyzed at the age of 18 when she dove off a dock into a lake. And she became a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down in this incredible, intelligent, talented, creative, beautiful woman. Her testimony has reached all over the world now. And she tells the story shortly after she was paralyzed, how she would go to her church. And she went to an Episcopal church, a traditional church, a liturgical church, you know, the the kind where you stand and you kneel and you, you do all the things at the right time in the service. And she said that every time that the pastor would call the congregation to kneel since her accident, she would just burst into tears because she would feel like, I'll never be a part of this. Something so simple that people like us could take for granted. Kneeling down in church, she said, I, I won't be able to do it. And then one day as they were praying, it dawned on her that in the resurrection, she would have a body. She wouldn't just be a spirit floating in the, crowd, in the clouds. She would have a resurrected body. And so she decided that day when that perspective of the resurrection became real to her, that the first thing she was going to do is fall to her knees and glorify the risen, living, reigning Son of God. And then she said, the next thing I'm going to do is get up and dance on my feet. And she added this, can you imagine the hope that the resurrection gives someone like me with a spinal cord injury? Can you imagine the hope that the resurrection gives someone like me suffering from depression after my accident? She's now 74 years old. She's lived 56 years waiting 
with this hope, choosing, choosing to believe the view from the empty tomb. Yes, the world is still broken. Yes, there is still pain. Yes, we still experience suffering. But imagine if this is not the only way the world will ever be. Imagine if this is not the only body you will ever live in. Imagine if this is not the only life that you'll ever experience. Imagine if you choose to believe that, how free you become. You become free from fear, free to love this world because the resurrection announces that God loves this world. God so loves this world that he gave his son who died and who rose again to raise us up with all creation that he is redeeming. Church, that's good news. That is good news. Martin Luther, the famous reformer was asked once, if you knew that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would you do? What would you do if you knew that Jesus was coming back tomorrow? You know what he said? I'd plant a tree. A weird thing to say. (laughs) Such a weird thing to say. But if you think about it, it it, it makes sense. And it makes sense why so often we don't answer that way because I don't think we fully realize or expect that our ordinary life is going to be redeemed. And if that sounds strange to you, think about this. Ordinary life is what we love, isn't it? Isn't it sitting with friends and family around the campfire? Isn't it good food? Isn't it hugs and dancing and oceans and mountains? Isn't that what we love about life? Listen. The hope of the resurrection is not that we're going to float on a cloud somewhere with a harp. The hope of the resurrection is that God himself is going to come and raise us up and redeem this world, a new heaven and a new earth, and Jesus will be the king of all of it. He is the king because he's risen from the dead, and he's given his life for us. So where should we begin if we, if we want to be people who choose to believe this, the view from the empty tomb, where should we begin? Well, come as you are to start. There's no heroes needed in this story. We don't read about them in Mark 16. No one's heroic. No one's inspiring. Everybody's afraid. Everyone's doubting. Everyone's hiding, but... They're invited to come and see. And so are you. You don't have to have it all figured out before you come. You can bring all of your doubts and all of your questions. Come just as you are, but come to the empty tomb and see for yourself. Don't don't be lazy. Don't say, well, My worldview doesn't allow for things like that to happen. Neither did theirs. But the evidence challenged their worldview because they came and saw the empty tomb for themselves. And I'm asking you to come today too. What if it's true? Consider it. And then what I hope, what I hope is that you'll choose to believe that Jesus is risen from the dead, that your past does not have to determine your future and that you do not have to walk without hope because Jesus is alive. And so we never, never, never walk alone. That's the good news that we're celebrating today on Easter. 
Well, what a gift the Gospels are as we get to look into the life of Jesus and see God dwelling among us, real flesh and blood, a, a human being just like us. And I hope that these teachings will inspire you and us to really pray and think through uh, as we learn from Jesus what it looks like to be his disciples in everyday life. And so wherever you're watching, we're in this together. That's our goal is to be fully formed and to become more like him. So thanks for watching.